author of the bestseller, The Woman in the Window, which is currently in development as a major film, in conversation with eminent writer and journalist, Ms. Amrita Tripathi. Hi everyone, thanks so much for showing up on time and that includes um, AJ Finn. It does not, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's great that you've been able to make it and really looking forward to the conversation we're As about to I. have. Um, I do want to ask you first off, because AJ Finn is the, the name you write under. Yes. Um, what do I call you? Do I call you? I answer to literally anything, okay. but um, I think in this context, <laughs> probably AJ. That'll, that'll, that'll be fine then. Um, so I'm not sure how many people here have had a chance to read your book. Can we have a, maybe a show of hands? Oh, there you go. Oh, that's oh, awesome. Thank okay. you. Okay. So we don't have to worry too much about spoilers, or should we worry a little bit about spoilers? <laughs> don't worry about spoilers. Can we talk about the creepy ending a little bit? <laughs> we can talk about whatever you like. <laughs> but, um, no, that's great to know. I mean, I think that let's start with um, um, a little bit about what led to this story. And I do want to talk to you about your journey, because, of course, you've, uh, you've been a publisher as well, and then there's this best-selling book. Yes. It's going to be a movie very soon with yes. uh, Amy Adams. Um, but to start at the beginning, what led, led you down this path to write this book? So I started writing this book in the summer of 2015. And about six weeks prior, I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And to some, that would be quite a frightening diagnosis. But to me, it was actually a relief because for 15 years prior to that, I had suffered from very debilitating depression. And it often kept me housebound, I found it difficult to work to sustain relationships, and I managed to scrape by so much so that I got a pretty senior gig in publishing, but I was thoroughly unhappy. And then one day in the summer of 2015, I sat down with a, a psychiatrist who grilled me for 90 minutes, and at the end of this, he said, I think you've been misdiagnosed. I don't think you've got depression. I think you've got bipolar disorder. And I said to him, you know, I've seen Homeland, and... <laughs> I've never gone full carry. And he said, no, I think you've got a variant called bipolar 2, where in the highs are not as dizzying, not as manic, but the lows are lower and more enduring. And so he prescribed some new drugs, and within about six weeks, I felt significantly improved. I wanted to explore what I'd been through. See, they're cheering for me. That's right. Yep. <laughs> I wanted to explore what I'd been through in print, but I did not want to write a memoir about depression, because that would be depressing. I think, both to read and to write. One of the aspects of crime fiction that I love so much, and I spent 10 years working as a crime fiction publisher and editor, is that on occasion, not always, not even often, but sometimes, you can experience a crime novel on two levels. You can savor the superficial twists and turns of the story, the reversals and the surprise endings, scratch the surface, and sometimes you're exposed to a deeper or more resonant experience. And that's what I wanted to write, a book with more in its head and in its heart than your average thriller. Yeah, and yet the suspense is amazing as well. Oh, and it good. Keeps you, um, it keeps you on your seat. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about Anna Fox. And yes. I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of a reading, if that's yes, okay with you. Yes, of course. Um, so Anna Fox, for those of you who've read this, know that you know, she's a very, very interesting character. Almost up, up front, you realize that she's, um, she's dealing with this condition, which is, is quite debilitating for her, yes. even though she's a psychologist. Um, and you, and you, you, know, you follow her on a journey where you know, she's unable to leave the house. Um, at the same time, though, she's playing such an important role, and I wanted to ask you about this um, specifically, because uh, she is on a sort of online chat space providing yep. uh, psychological help to folks who need it. Um, so tell us a little bit about that duality, because it's so important to who she is. Of course, it plays an important role in the, the way the story progresses. Uh, the chat room, yeah, the chat yeah. forum. Oftentimes in these novels, which almost invariably star women, usually in their 20s or 30s, Anna Fox is 39, my age, in this book, the women and I find this quite depressing, are almost invariably helpless. They spend a lot of time fretting about men or obsessing over men or waiting for a man to rescue them. And this is not like most women I know. Most women I know can more than manage the men in their lives. My mother could kick my dad's ass if she wanted to. <laughs> One of the reasons I like this character is because she does not wait for a man to rescue her. 
Moreover, she is generous in a way that I think a lot of mental health therapists are. Anna, as you've noted, is stricken with agoraphobia. She cannot leave the house. She drinks too much. She doesn't take care of herself. But still, she seeks to reach out and comfort and counsel other people. So it was important to me to find a way for her to demonstrate that compassion. And lo and behold, the internet presented itself. Very often in contemporary suspense plotting, I have found that the internet and digital technology are kind of plot killers. It used to be that you could strand your heroine down a dark alley. Nowadays, she just whips out her phone and calls Siri, and it's <laughs> problem solved. In this case, the internet proved a way for me to advance the story. Yeah, and it's interesting. So I, I do some work in the mental health space uh, yes. as, a, as a reporter and storyteller. And what ends up happening is a lot of people um, find that, you know, the, the pockets of good that they can find onli are online. Yes. Uh, you know, there's, there's something about that anonymity that also works in, um, in Anna's favor in this story, right? Because she's able to, without sharing too much of her own journey, go back to being the psychologist that she was uh, before this terrible trauma. Yes. Um, at the same time, though, I do want to ask you, I mean, do you think partly that compassion also comes because she understands so personally what it's like? Because I think with, with, with regular people and certainly with yourself, I'm, um, I'm curious to know, um, people who've had to deal with so much darkness and difficulty and, and go on that journey, do you find that they tend to be more compassionate and understanding because she's not judgmental at all? Yep. Um, of course, we find someone abusing that trust quite drastically without <laughs> sharing too much of the story, but Me too. She, uh, she's able to help them in a way that you wouldn't expect, um, you know, maybe from someone who's not been through so much difficulty and trauma. Speaking for myself and on behalf of those I've met who have struggled with mental health issues or who continue to do so, those afflicted with, for example, bipolar disorder are not necessarily superheroes, even though that's the way media often represent them to be, movies in particular. Mm -hmm. They're these tortured geniuses. I'm not a genius yet. You might be a genius. Give me time. No, let's talk about that advance and uh, best-selling <laughs> copies. <laughs> you might be a genius, yes. But... but Having struggled as I've done and having watched others struggle, I've come to appreciate that to deal with a mental health issue endows one or equips one with terrific resilience and also empathy. Yeah. I have many, 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 many vices and many fewer virtues, but one of those virtues is empathy. Yeah. I am curious about other people. I try to be compassionate towards other people. And those are the best qualities of myself that I sought to invest in this character. I th yeah, and I think that's very interesting because the kindness really comes through. And Good. empathy is, um, it, it's really core to Anna's character. Um, let's have you do a little bit of a reading. Yes, and then we'll do you talk have a passage how, in particular? I, maybe from the beginning because I think, I don't, we have a lot of people who've read this. But, sure. Uh, if you have, do you have a favorite? I, I, the beginning is fine. Do you want me to read the... Actually, I think I'll read part of the beginning, yeah, if that's okay. Like a page and a bit. Yes. So this is, this is chapter one. Her husband's almost home. He'll catch her this time. There isn't a scrap of curtain, not a blade of blind, in number 212, the rust-red townhome that once housed the newlywed Mots until recently, until they unwed. I never met either Mott, but occasionally I check in online, his LinkedIn profile, her Facebook page. Their wedding registry lives on at Macy's. I could still buy them flatware. As I was saying, not even a window dressing. So number 212 gazes blankly across the street, ruddy and raw, and I gaze right back, watching the mistress of the manor lead her contractor into the guest bedroom. What is it about that house? It's where love goes to die. She's lovely, a genuine redhead with grass-green eyes and an archipelago of tiny moles trailing across her back, much prettier than her husband, a Dr. John Miller, psychotherapist, yes, he offers couples counseling, and one of 436,000 John Millers online. This particular specimen works near Gramercy Park and does not accept insurance. According to the deed of sale, he paid 3.6 million for his house. Business must be good. You know, it occurs to me in reading this that the book um, could get off to a more exciting start. No, I think it's a great start. You know what? <laughs> Let's give you a round of applause. I want to. Uh, that thank was not you. a planned. Uh, <laughs> I sort of sprang that on you. Um, you know what I love about the beginning, actually, is you have you have no idea where the story is going to go from there. Good. Um, which is obviously what you want in a suspense, psychological suspense thriller. Yes. But you already get to know that this character, your main character, and this is so much so characteristic of the way. She is, she's an observer, she's almost a voyeur, like very voyeuristic, totally. what she does. Yes. She can't get out of the house, but she's so curious about what's going on in her neighborhood. And like you've said, I mean, I think someone's described it, that, that window is really her, it's her lifeline, right, to what's going on. So I did an interview about nine months ago with the Toronto Star, and one of the things I've learned about journalists, 
at least print journalists, is that they take considerable liberty and license with the facts. I often read quotes that I was not clever enough to come up with myself or find myself misrepresented in, in the media. And this particular journalist quoted me as having said, what is a novelist if not the ultimate voyeur? I did not say that, <laughs> but I wish I had, so I'm going to claim I said that. And there is a parallel, I think, between writing fiction and observing the lives of others. That is what you do when you write fiction. I started writing this book in my tiny Manhattan apartment in which I still live, and it got started one night when I was on my sofa watching Rear Window. And in the corner of my eye, in my peripheral vision, I clocked a light being switched on. It was my neighbor across the street in Manhattan switching on her living room lamp. And so in accordance with fine New York City custom, I spied on her. <laughs> and she wasn't doing anything particularly interesting. She was a woman in early middle age in a bathrobe with somewhat greasy, disheveled hair, aiming a remote at her television. And behind me, on my own television, where Rear Window was playing, I heard Thelma Ritter, one of the actresses in the film, say to James Stewart, you shouldn't spy on people. <laughs> <laughs> you look out your window, you see something you shouldn't, that's trouble. And when I turned back, she seemed to be glaring at me. And just like that, this character strode into my mind. Yeah. And she looked a lot like the woman in the window across the street. That's Incidentally, I have not introduced myself to that woman. <laughs> and I probably owe her royalties, so... <laughs> You can say hi now if you I like. Can say, Hello, neighbor. <laughs> yes. Thanks for that. Sure. <laughs> I think, and I did take this from an interview, so hopefully it was accurate. Um, they, they, <laughs> they were talking about uh, how, you know, I mean, and you read in the book, Anna, one of the traits, you know, something that uh, the passion she sort of shares with her husband or introduces him to is sort of classical noir movies. Yes. A lot of Hitchcock. But they said Rear Win Window is one that's not named at all in the book. Th that actually, they did quote me accurately. I said that to an Australian journalist, but I was wrong. There is a reference ah. to Rear Window in the book, so. Okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, see, you can't trust anything anymore. Yeah, you, I'm a liar. <laughs> Especially when, <laughs> when you're reading a book like this. Um, I think what's, what's really fascinating also is the way that... Um, the, the, the entire premise, and again, without giving too many spoilers away, is that she observes something dramatic happening. Yes. Do you want to, uh, I mean, and I ask you about this. She observes something dramatic happening, thinks something terrible uh, is going wrong, and then proceeds to realize that uh, she's not in a position to get anyone to believe her. And, and the way you write that is actually really, it's very tangible. Um, it's almost like everyone is seeing her as this near hysterical person, and then they're starting, starting to judge her because they're like, well, you have this condition, you're drinking too much. I mean, everyone's talking about the wine glasses, she's on medication. Um, that was really interesting to me because it's also showing this very fragile s state of things, right? And how quickly things can unravel. So I, I have two responses to that. The first is that this is how people with mental health issues are commonly perceived and treated in society, as though they have nothing useful to contribute, as though their lives are lived on the edge or in the margins, which is often the case that they are not necessarily individuals of value. There are whole tracts of my life that I don't remember very clearly. I can look back at instances of behavior or at things I've said and I think, why did I do or say that? That's not like me. And in the aftermath of these episodes, you find yourself thinking, what did I do? Why? Who knows about it? It's unnerving. And so when people treat you that way, sometimes you think, I deserve it. One of the things I like about Anna is that she tries to stand up for herself. My other response is that not only is this how mental health individuals are treated, it's how women are commonly treated. So often, police and other officials seem to take a more skeptical view of women than they do of men. Had this character been a man, I don't doubt that the police would have treated her as more credible than they do as a woman. So I do see parallels. I'm going to state this very gingerly. I'm not comparing women to mental health patients. But I do see parallels between the way these two figures or communities are treated? I mean, structurally, in terms of discrimination, I understand. I mean, yeah, of yes. course. That, uh, in terms of how, um, well, I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about your story then, because uh, if, if there were one or two things you would want people to know, for example, um, yep. before we come back to your journey as a publisher to multi-millionaire author and <laughs> best-selling. <laughs> sure, um, that's the fun part. If, if there was, you know, I mean, I think w what comes across when we're talking about compassion, kindness, but if, if, what is a, if there was one message you had for friends and families of, or loved ones of people who are suffering from mental health conditions, what would that be? I would say, I actually know this, I have it in my back pocket. I would urge people who are suffering from a mental health issue and I would remind those who care about them, and even those who don't know much about them, that there's nothing wrong with them. Suffering from a mental health issue is not the most interesting aspect 
of you. It is not the second most interesting aspect of you. It is not the 20th most interesting. It is just an aspect of you. It doesn't mean you're flawed. It doesn't mean you're defective. In some ways, it can prove an asset. As I said earlier, I've learned a lot about resilience and a lot about empathy. Yeah. I remember reading a book by Andrew Solomon, who's an American nonfiction writer. This book is called The Noonday Demon, an Atlas of Depression, and it's a history of depression throughout the past few millennia. And Andrew Solomon himself struggles with depression. He said, I would not trade my depression for anything. And I thought, you know, fuck, I would. <laughs> if he wants more, he can have mine. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. So. That's my message to those. There's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. And it's, it's more than just this label, like you're saying. It's just one aspect yeah. of many. No, I think that's really powerful. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your journey. You didn't always know you wanted to write a best-selling novel, or no. did you? No, 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 I did not. So when you entered uh, the world of publishing, can you take us through a little bit about what your, you know, the, the core interest? Obviously, literature was a huge um, interest, but you were also interested in psychological thrillers and suspense from the beginning? Or yes. how did that? So I'd done my MPhil at Oxford, and I focused on the, the American writer Patricia Highsmith, who wrote The Talented Mr. Ripley and Strangers on a Train. And what sort of thrilled me about Highsmith was that she subverted the mores and norms of detective fiction. I grew up reading Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie, and what I loved about detective fiction, the reason I think detective fiction has been enshrined for 150 years as the world's most popular genre, is that it ultimately functions as a sort of moral education or moral assurance. By the end of a Sherlock Holmes story or a Christie novel, we know that the guilty will have been punished or prosecuted, the virtuous rewarded or redeemed, and that order and justice will be upheld or restored and that's reassuring to us, particularly in a world where things don't usually shake out that way. Yeah. Highsmith, however, undermines all that. She persuades us in the talented Mr. Ripley through some dark alchemy to root for a serial killer. Tom Ripley is the bad guy, yet we're sort of on his side. A journalist, I do have issues with journalists, I guess, recently said to me, oh, are you sort of like Tom Ripley? No, I've killed like two people, he's killed seven. So there's a key distinction there. In any event, I did my MPhil on this author at Oxford, and then I went into American publishing, focusing on detective fiction. And after three years of that, two and a half years, I returned to Oxford for the first two years of my doctorate before I realized I did not want to continue in academia. So I chucked that in, moved to London, got a senior position at a publishing house, again, focusing on crime and thrillers. One of the reasons I like focusing on them, apart from my editorial interest in this genre, is that crime and thrillers, as mentioned earlier, rank as the most popular genres in the world. So if you're working on these books, you're pretty much assured a relatively high profile within your publishing house, which matters to one whose ambitions in his career are pronounced. I do remember when I started in publishing, I wanted to work on literary fiction, as we call it in the States, because that's what I'd read for the most part as an undergraduate. The thing is, there aren't many jobs going in literary fiction because literary fiction does not sell particularly well. For every Arundhati Roy, there are about 150 authors you've never heard of. So that was my publishing journey. After we sold the book, I stayed in my job for one year because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to support myself as a writer. I was saying to some new friends in the drive over here that throughout the course of my career, I had routinely seen books acquired amid much fanfare and at great expense, only to bomb when they were released in the market. This happens all the time. And I didn't want to chuck in my career only to find myself with a no promising writing career ahead of me. But a few months before publication, I thought to myself, this feels as though it's going to work to a level. And then I quit my job four or five days before the book was published because I felt confident and because I was rich. <laughs> so. That helps. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting that, well, I read if, if some of these journalists can be trusted, and we have to talk about the scarring experience. Um, as, I, as someone who's been a journalist for 15 years, we have to work on this for yes, you. Yes, sure. <laughs> but uh, you, you submitted it anom anonymously to yes. your... Yes, I submitted the book anonymously because I worked in publishing, and I did not want editors to judge the manuscript because they knew me one way or the other. We chose a gender-neutral pseudonym not to deceive a wider public, although plenty of people do think, well, they... They think I'm a woman even after they've met me, but they do think I'm a woman having read the book. 
uh, but because there are about five men working in American publishing, and my agent noted in her submission letter that the author worked in publishing, so if I'd called myself, you know, Tony Finn, they would have figured out who I was pretty quickly. We kept the pseudonym because it had been publicized that way, but in every article about me, my ugly mug is covered with stubble. And I did not expect, this sounds like false modesty, it's not, I did not expect people to buy the book, simply because people, publishers, to buy the book, because the market is glutted with psychological thrillers. And I remember I was en route to Palm Springs for a holiday, a few days after the book was submitted, about a day and a half, actually. And my agent rang me, I was in a New Jersey airport, an exotic New Jersey airport, and she said, well, great news, we've got an offer on the book. Keep your phone on in mid-flight, and I did, and as we were flying over the country, these offers kept pouring in, it was thrilling. And I spent that week in Palm Springs, slouched in a hot tub, sipping margaritas and snarling at small children. <laughs> I, I'm not a huge fan of children. And by the time I was ready to go back to New York, we were still conducting an auction for the books. I was in Los Angeles airport, and the lesson here is I should spend more time in airports because good things happen. And the agent rings and she says, well, Fox have made an offer for the movie rights, but it's an exploding offer. And I said, oh, that sounds you know, dangerous but sexy. What is an exploding offer? And she said, it means that I've got them on the other line and you have to say yes or no to their offer right now. Are you ready? I said, yes. She said, it's a million dollars. Do you want it? <laughs> you know, let me think. So I said, yes, I want that. And she hung up, and I desperately wanted to tell someone, but there was no one in the terminal with me except for this lovely Japanese family. There was a, a mother and a father and a small four-year-old child, and I don't speak Japanese, and I hadn't heard them speaking English. So I just turned to them, and I smiled, and I gave them a thumbs up, and bless them, every single one, including the kid, did the same thing back to me. <laughs> it was really sweet. They never call, they never write, but it was a nice moment. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, I think that, that there should be a movie about the making of this, <laughs> you know, clearly. Um, so if you have, I mean, I was just scanning also to see, to see if there were any kids in the audience. I don't see any, so if you're not losing readers there with those comments, that's good. Oh, good. Always a good thing. Um, but if you have uh, any advice, because there are always like a lot of um, aspiring writers, potential writers, writers who have not been able to like break into, because as you said, it's a tough business to also... Massively. Yeah. Yes. So any advice? Um, yes, I've got several pieces of advice, actually. I've been dispensing these throughout my editorial career but they still hold true even though I'm now an author. The first piece of advice is that you absolutely must read. If you try to write without reading, it's like trying to compose a song without listening to any music. You won't really know where to begin. Reading exposes you to new voices, to new tricks, to techniques. It can be instructive in showing you what not to do. So that's the first step. The second is to remember that it is work, it is hard. So don't beat yourself up if it's not going especially well. I know authors, I've published authors who have written 20, 25 books, and it's still agony for them every single time. I didn't have a great time writing this book. I'm really selling this as a career, aren't I? <laughs> it's not always fun, but it's a job. So don't beat yourself up if you're not enjoying it wholly. And uh, the final piece of advice is, whilst you should write work that is of personal interest to you, you should also keep an eye on the market. I sometimes hear authors or publishers advising aspiring writers to write what you want, write from the heart. That is absolutely acceptable and advisable, but it's good to bear in mind what's actually out there, what you see on bookshelves, even what's on the bestseller lists. You want to write something, presumably because you want people to read it. So be market conscious. That's my final piece of advice. So when you were, I mean, let me ask you a hypothetical. If this book hadn't sold uh, in you know, the phenomenal way it is doing, yeah. I mean, one is, of course, getting the publisher to buy it. And then two, like you said, having it released um, um, and, and sort of uh, across, across the world, multiple editions, different languages? Uh, 41 languages. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. great. Um, would you have, would you have uh, completely hypothetical, it's almost impossible to answer this question, but even if it had not reached this phenomenal level of success, do you think that you would have still gone on um, to write another book or tried to, because it is, like you said, it's hard work, it's a bit of a slog, and sometimes it doesn't feel like there's a market out there. What would you have, how would you have seen it? I felt quite proud of myself for having written a book. As, as soon as I typed the words, the end, I thought, oh, I've actually completed a novel. And that's, that's, 
that's the part of this entire adventure of which I'm most proud. I, I'm thrilled that it sold so well. I'm excited about the movie, but I've written a book, irrespective of its publication status. I, I was pleased with myself. So I'd like to think that if this book had not been acquired and published, I would have gone on to write another, having proven to myself that I could do it once, provided, and this is a key proviso, that I had a story. I, as both a publisher and a reader, respond very much to books driven by narratives. I despair when a book sort of meanders and it navel gazes deep into the belly buttons of its characters. So if a story had presented itself to me, then I'd like to think, yes, I would have pursued it. Not an impossible question to answer. Then. No, no, no. <laughs> it's also kind of a it's kind of a calling, clearly, because I mean I think you you, you love um, literature, you love stories. I do. Yes. Um, and there's obviously a huge interest and curiosity that you know as a writer that comes across in the book about people. Oh, good. Um, I feel I'm yeah, inquisitive. Yes, good. Uh, inquisitive. Um, if you had to, um, I mean I don't think you could have guessed it was going to be uh, until that exploding auction <laughs> phone call. <laughs> that it was going to be this movie. Uh, Amy Adams is starring in this movie. It's Can you uh, tell us any more? Yes, the movie is directed. Uh, it, they finished shooting in October, and the film will be released next autumn in India, I believe, in September, September 27th. The movie is directed by an Englishman named Joe Wright, who made the film Darkest Hour, which just won Gary Oldman the Oscar last year. He made Atonement and Pride and Prejudice, both with Keira Knightley. The cast includes Amy Adams, playing the lead, Julianne Moore, who plays the maybe murder victim, and Gary Oldman, again, reuniting with his director. The film is produced by a guy named Scott Rudin, who won an Oscar for No Country for Old Men and also made The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Grand Budapest Hotel, Zoolander 2. Uh, you can't win them all, yeah. yes. <laughs> Another highly anticipated yep. movie, actually. That's incredible. Um, so let me ask you, and you know, when you're talking about a subgenre, we're gonna open up for questions, so please start keeping, like, putting your thoughts together um, better than I'm doing. But um, when you're talking about the kind of books that, you know, this, this sort of subgenre that has kind of, you know, it's not the Agatha Christie's and the Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Um, Gone Girl, Girl on a Train, these are all books you've read and enjoyed, I think, if interviews are to be believed. Some to greater degrees than others, okay. but I'm a huge fan of Gone Girl. And when I, yeah, sorry, you have the, you have the- Gillian Flynn, of, yeah, yes, of, yes, of so I'm an even bigger fan of Gone Girl now. <laughs> Gone Girl, to me, represents a sort of specimen of book I was referring to earlier, books with more in their heads and in their hearts than your average thriller. That is a particularly well-plotted book. Yeah. It springs a massive surprise in the middle, quite a volte fass. It's also a novel with a lot to say about women, men, yeah. misogyny, matrimony. That book continues to haunt me seven years after I turned its final page and yeah. long after I learned the final twist. And not all psychological thrillers offer that sort of substance. Most don't. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine. You also have a blurb from Stephen King, which I think is incredible. I didn't know that he did those very often or he, anymore. He he does. He's uh, Stephen King is actually tremendously supportive of young ooh, writers, right? Of you young writers. Yeah, I'm I'm, third, I'm 39, <laughs> but I'll take it. That that came out the wrong way. But yeah, you know no, what I mean. that he's, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I know he's been. Uh, yeah, go on. So I was checking my Gmail one day and I saw I had a message in my inbox that said from Steve King. And Steve King is the name of a notorious Republican congressman in America and I thought, why the hell does he have my email address and what does he want? But no, it was that other Stephen King who said, I enjoyed your book, would you like a quote? And yes, please, I would like That's a quote. incredible, yep. this is really, that is something else. Um, Oh, just last question for now before we break to the audience. If, from the writers you've published um, yes. as, as an editor, anyone that you want, would recommend, obviously all of them, but a short list or, and have you been in touch with them in this new avatar? Yes, so most of the authors whom I published were incredibly gracious about me becoming a writer myself. I will say to my credit, I tried hard to observe a strict separation of church and state as did my publisher because my, my employer actually became my publisher, which could have been uncomfortable but worked out really well. The authors I published, oh gosh, I like a lot of them and I like a lot of their work. There's a Chicago-based novelist called Sarah Paretsky who writes a terrific series of crime novels featuring a female detective, a private investigator. I recommend her work. There's a husband-wife team called Nikki French who write psychological thrillers not dissimilar to my own. So those are, those are two whom I would highlight. It's incredible, and, and you're now... Um I guess. Like, what is it with the? Is there a convention? <laughs> I, I mean, they are they are much more talented than I am. But 
I happen to know, having been their publisher, that I make more money than they do, so. <laughs> that might not come up in front it, of It's not, please, I hope, this is being recorded, yes. <laughs> but have you heard from them? Uh, after yes, the, they've oh, been wonderful. Nikki incredible. French actually gave me a quote for this. Sarah Paretsky is one of my favorite oh, people. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's open up for questions. Can you put up your, oh, there we go. Okay, so there's one right here. Hi. Um, Hi. I just finished the book today morning, and it was absolutely unputdownable. Oh, thank I you. I couldn't stop, and especially, I think it, it, it took time to build up. Yes. But the end bit is, is just crazy. <laughs> and uh, what I wanted to ask, so what you said, the, bo the book works at two levels, it does. So it is a crime thriller, but it, yet it gave me a view into the world of people suffering from mental health issues. Good. So that was really wonderful. Uh, the one thing I want, Anna Fox is a psychologist herself. Yes, right? she's a, psych a child psychologist. Yeah, and so she does understand the issues, yet she's not, and she's advising people, yet she's not able to come out of it herself, right? Yes, that's true, she's locked in herself. So why did you decide to make her a health professional and yet give her this disease? That's an excellent question. And I should say that having banged on a fair bit about mental health, this book is not a treatise on mental health. It is a thriller, first and foremost. But it does engage with those serious themes. I made her a psychologist because, as I stated earlier, I think psychologists and psychiatrists, and I've dealt with quite a few in my day, are very generous people. You don't get into that field if you don't care about helping others. And I wanted to spend time in the head of a character who was compassionate. So that was important to me, to give her a profession consistent with the qualities I wanted to evince in her. As for why I struck her with this disease, agoraphobia is a real condition. It translates from the Latin as fear of the market, but it's really applied to a host of anxiety disorders, the classic one of which is an inability to leave the house. I thought this might be a nice metaphor for her state. She is locked into her mind, into her traumatized psyche, just as she is locked inside her house. Also, it's sort of a nod to a lot of classic film noir, particularly the work of Alfred Hitchcock. And I do think there's a distinction between film noir and Hitchcock. We can get to that another time. Hitchcock routinely set his films in confined spaces. In Rear Window, we're in a New York apartment. In Rope, we're in a New York apartment. In Dial M for Murder, we're in a London apartment. In Lifeboat, we're in a lifeboat, and I thought it would be an interesting challenge to try to set a book in a single set. I'd seen movies that took place in one setting. I'd seen plays that do the same. I couldn't think of many novels. I still can't think of many novels, and now I know why. It is damn difficult. Uh, hands. Oh, there's one in the front row. Really enjoyed the talk. I was just wondering, how did it function with your dual selves as an author and as an editor when you're working on the book? Did you feel the editor in you coming out and tampering with your process? Because you also were an editor in the same genre that you write in. That's correct. Was that helpful or was that frustrating because I come from the same space? I'm also worked in publishing and I'm also an author. And I'm just wondering how it works for you. Well, I'd be interested, how do you find it? Uh, <laughs> The thing is, I was uh, in publishing, but I dealt with different genres, and I also write in different genres. Do I? So I do know how it works in different genres and I different see. formats. So I correct myself, yep. and I know what the others are doing, and I want to do something different, but I know, also know what it works with, so like a jumble in my head. So I'm yes. Gonna, so I want to ask how it works for you. So I, my novel is chopped up into 100 bite-sized chapters, and I wrote it entirely in sequence. I wrote chapter one, put on my editor hat, gave myself some advice, put on my writer hat, accepted my excellent advice, rewrote the chapter, and then moved on to the next chapter. So by the time I completed chapter 100, I hadn't reread any of the previous chapters. So I, I did find it helpful, actually, to toggle between the two roles. It meant, too, that by the time the manuscript was submitted to publishers, it was more or less as you read it in the book. Now, the next one is a damn mess, so my editor is going to have her work cut out for her. <laughs> that was, what, um, uh, can you talk about the next one already? Do you have anything you want to share? I can't say much about it, except that it is another psychological thriller, and the characters actually set foot outside, which is a refreshing change. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hands for questions? A couple in that. Um, 
So did you ever have any major write writer's block and what kept you motivated to keep writing? S writer's block? Yes. Oh, uh, and did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? Did you have another career option in mind? And what made you go with the writing option? Okay, so the first two questions, writer's block and how did I keep myself motivated? I did not have writer's block on this book. I outlined it extensively, about a 7,500 word outline, and the final novel is 90,000 words. So that's, that's a chunk. And this helped me ensure that every beat was mapped out. Some writers, quite a lot of writers, talk about how as they write the book, their characters surprise them. If my characters surprise me, it means my medication isn't working. I do not wish to be surprised by my characters, so I knew exactly what would happen, which helped me stave off writer's block. I did anticipate heading into this enterprise that plotting the book would prove challenging because I'd never told a story before. I'd written quite a lot. I'd written my master's dissertation. I'd written a lot of copy as a publisher. I thought the writing would be easy. It was very much the other way around. The plot came together within a couple of days, and the writing took a year. I kept myself motivated, by setting a daily quota for myself of a thousand words. And this is a trick I learned from Stephen King's book on writing, which is called Unwriting. I think he writes something like 2,000 words a day. I set myself a benchmark of half that, and oftentimes I would junk every single word, but most days, pretty much every day, I hit that benchmark. And the second question was about uh, what other career I might have entertained had I not become a writer. As a kid, I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I wasn't smart enough. Uh, and also, I've got, I've got what's called an essential tremor, which means my hand sort of shakes, so you would not want me operating on your dog, which is, which is a loss for dogs. I do love them. Had I not become a writer, I think I would have remained quite happily in publishing. I really liked my job. I really liked most of the authors with whom I work, and I like communicating with readers. It's very, um, it's very gratifying. Which you now can do as a writer. Yes. Uh, most of the authors with, which you, with whom you work. Interesting. You said as a publisher, we'll come I to that. I did, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> this is why he doesn't like journalists, I feel. I see what happens. <laughs> okay, next, there's a couple in the back. Yeah, my question is, uh, the American cultural milieu is popular globally due to the power of Hollywood. Say, if uh, how can a novel attain uh, global popularity if it is, uh, say, set in India, in Mumbai, for example, because uh, India is usually projected as a stereotype. That's a really good question, and my answer is probably going to be somewhat discouraging. New York City is immortalized on film as a place of glamour and excitement, and this is because these films are made by American movie makers. American audiences, moreover, are, and this will not surprise you, not at all curious about other cultures, which is probably the single greatest failing of American culture, this myopia, this, this sense that there's nothing outside America. So you can get away with setting a novel in the States, not least because there are a lot of iconic cities. Problematically, and again, I don't like saying this, but I was just saying it a, 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 about half an hour ago. India is most popularly represented in the States by the film Slumdog Millionaire, which, and I've only been here a couple days, is not remotely representative. And that's troubling to me. That said, I believe quite earnestly that if you tell the right story, the setting is almost immaterial. The setting can enhance the narrative, but it is not itself the narrative. The woman in the window is set in New York, and I set it there because I live there, and because I thought there was a sort of irony about a woman who lives in one of the world's most populous cities but can't actually set foot outside. It could just as easily have been set in Mumbai. It could just as easily have been set literally anywhere. I'm not saying you need to set the action in a single confined space, but remember to tell the story first, and you can apply the atmosphere as window dressing afterwards. And I say this in full knowledge that many, many Indian writers are hugely successful in America. They tend to skew towards the literary. I would like to see more writers of commercial fiction hail from India and achieve global success.
mic up plus uh, some mics uh, some mic something some hands over there we have about 20 minutes so definitely more time for questions um, we'll send the mic around yeah hi. Uh, hi i just finished reading your book i think a week back it was so interesting that i had to do reading through lunch breaks and all that uh, you mentioned that it is a book of many bite-sized chapters. One would think the most interesting chapter is the twist at the end, but no, my favorite chapter was like uh, a chapter where two, the two women are catching up over wine and a game of chess. That was an amazing chapter for me. <laughs> so what I would like to ask is, as a writer, after a chapter you have finished, is there, a, is there any chapter which you have finished and you have thought to yourself, oh my, that went very well. In, in this book in particular? In this, in this book or uh, without giving away any spoilers in your next book, that also can be, of course, an uh, option for you. So I, I cut the book into so many bite-sized chapters because I do think it's an effective way of generating and sustaining momentum. I don't do well with long chapters, and I don't do particularly well with big blocks of text, at least not in fiction. I do like a lot of dialogue, and there is a lot of dialogue and many short sentences in this novel. There's an American author named James Patterson, and I don't read his books, but he does feature very short chapters in his novels, and you just fly through them. The hardest chapter in this novel is a chapter in which, and I don't want to say too much, the heroine is confronted with an alternative version of events, and she forces herself to accept it, perhaps correctly, perhaps incorrectly. And I drew on my own experience for that. I, I mentioned earlier that there are passages of my life that I don't remember or things I did that I can't account for. And when someone confronts you with that, you think to yourself, did I? Okay, I guess I did. And it's, it's a difficult process to articulate both to oneself and on the page. My favorite chapter is, well, chapters, um, if I may, uh, constitute the climax. I really like the climax of this book. It's, um, it's sort of melodramatic, but I think it's very filmic. So I, w I was very pleased with those. Creepy also. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was a re great question, by the way. Um. Oh, come okay. on. <laughs> I've come from New York. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Iconic city. Yes. Of which, um, but I suppose at some level, I mean, if I, if I can button with a question, but please do carry on and give that mic. I mean, do you feel that, um, uh, you just following on that question about like Indian writers and, uh, you know, breaking, breaking a global audience is a tough thing to do. Yes. But do you feel that sometimes um, non-American cultures feel that, that pressure to be representative? And did you feel that at all? Because, you know, sometimes if you're writing, like um, somebody mentioned, right? I mean, the Indian books tend to, or Slumdog Millionaire, there are yes. all these stereotypes and so on. Um, there can be pressure to be very representative. I mean, it, sometimes it'll come, maybe it'll come to you in more interviews or questions around mental health where they'll be like, are you going to be that? That ambassador. Yeah. And I don't wish to be. I'm happy to talk about it, but I don't want to be the sole spokesperson for something like that. As for locales, Cultural, yeah. Cultural. yes, exactly. I find it refreshing when novels go sort of countercultural. If I read one more Swedish crime novel in which the hero is a suicidal or alcoholic divorcee, I am going to do something damaging to myself. So I quite like, I quite like reading, for example, uh, Arundhati Roy's latest novel. It is not Slumdog Millionaire. It was refreshing to get a different perspective on Indian culture. I don't think that one needs to cater to or conform to stereotypes when writing. In fact, I would discourage writers to avoid that where possible because publishers at some point will get sick of publishing Swedish crime novels featuring tortured detectives. They will get tired of publishing French detective novels with very strange heroes in a way that the French and the French alone can write, and so on and so forth. So sometimes trying to peg to the audience becomes a bit problematic, right? Because then it, you feel it, like... Yes, and as an editor, you, you will read a submission and you think, oh, this, this displays or furnishes a view of which I was previously unaware. This is refreshing. I thought the mic would have reached by now. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in Woman in the Window, you follow this uh, really beautiful stream of consciousness, first person narrative. But for most of the story, Anna Fox doesn't leave her house. Yes. So I was wondering if you could tell us what goes into maintaining a tight and gripping narrative within such a confined 
geographical space? That's a really good question, and it's one I asked myself repeatedly when writing the novel. It is tough to keep the action moving when you're confined between four walls. And the book does cheat a little. For an agoraphobic, Anna gets out a fair amount of the time. I think she leaves her house on four occasions over the course of this novel, once every 100 pages or so. I introduce a fairly robust supporting cast who are happy to visit her at her home. The trick there was for it not to become like a French farce with all these doors opening and slamming shut. You don't want it to feel like a, a play. Mostly though, the challenge was not so much in the fact that she lives in one place, but the fact that it all takes place, as you say, in her mind. It is a very interior novel, and if you're going to keep things lively when most of the action takes place in someone's head, you've got to give that person an interesting or distinct voice. I quite like this character. She's frustrating, and she sometimes annoys me, but I also think she's kind of funny, and I think she's smart, and I think she's generous. So I didn't mind rattling around in her head, even though I didn't have much relief from her. I feel like she should make a comeback, and there should be a sequel at some point. Do you think that might happen? I do not. <laughs> okay, fine. I don't. Fine. I mean, just reject all my non best Sorry, ideas. Yes. She's done. <laughs> You're done with her. Yep. <laughs> um, next question. There was, yeah. Hi. Hi. Picked up your book right now, and I'm looking forward to reading it. And uh, It's a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm called a rab rabid reader by my friends because I think tomorrow. Uh, uh, what I wanted to ask you was a little away from the book since I haven't read it yet. Uh, is uh, Recently I've realized that there aren't too many people around who are reading books. Yep. And it's depressing frankly for someone who started reading Bernard Shaw in her sixth standard. Yep. So, uh, what would you say to yes, and now it's becoming difficult to get people to read books because everything is being turned into a movie or a series. Yep. So it's easier to just watch it. So what would you say uh, would help bring readers back to books? That's um, something that publishers discuss a lot. Right now, and presumably forevermore, there will be so much competition from films and TV, especially now that it's all streamable. It used to be that, at least in recent years, books had sort of a leg up because you could read them on your device, whereas you couldn't watch a movie or a television show on your device. Now you can. Audiobooks are booming in the West. I understand they haven't yet caught on in India. I'm pretty sure they will. And so that's an alternative method of consuming books. But what I would say, and I, I often say this to children, and remember I don't like children, but I'm happy to say this to them, when you watch a movie or when you read a TV show, no matter how involving, no matter how visionary, it is not your vision. You are watching someone else's imagination on the screen, and that can be enthralling, but it's a passive experience. You absorb it. When you are reading the, a book, that experience, that vision is yours and yours alone. No one else gets to experience it the way you do. It's customized. And that, for me, is why I will always prefer books to any other sort of media. It is something almost personalized for me. And as such, it requires more work. You can't just sit back and let words wash over you when you are reading a book. You have to participate. But at the same time, that's what makes the process so thrilling. You're almost working in partnership with the author to create this story. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. There's one in the... I, when I read the book, I thought actually I was so sure it's written by a woman. So how difficult was it for you to write from a woman's perspective, you know? Do you know, writing from a woman's perspective was not quite as difficult as I thought it would be, in part because although there are obviously key biological and psychological distinctions between men and women. I think these are sometimes overpronounced or overstated or even overblown. When I create a character, male or female, that character is part of me to some extent. So I 
don't want to say that I just tipped the contents of my head into this vessel and gave her the necessary parts, but I did think about my mother and my two sisters and how they talk and how they treat me. My mother is quite sardonic. Over Christmas holiday, one of my siblings, my brother, I think, said to her, oh, you think Dan is so special. And she said, I don't. I just think he's special compared to the rest of you. <laughs> Which I thought was awesome because I'm the special one. So I, I, I listened to their voices and blended them with my own. That's hilarious. We want to meet your mom next. She's awesome. <laughs> But, I mean, having said that, not because we're trying to bring Anna Fox back, but was it, I mean, part, part of the joy is when you're creating these characters, right? And then, like you said, they're, they're a part of you. The book is the story is a part of you. Yes. Letting go, how difficult is that? Because it's also such a personal story in this case, um, despite being a thriller and suspense. Thing. Because I'd outlined the book in pretty exacting detail, I was prepared to let these characters go. And also, much as I like Anna and interesting as I find her, she's not easy company in part because she reminds me of some dark periods in my own life, so I was not eager to stick around with her. There are a few characters whom I would have liked to have spent more time with, particularly the police detective, this, this man named Little. I just liked him, but uh, it's done. They're You're through. not making a comeback either. Nope. Thanks, thanks, dream squasher. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more? We'll take a couple more questions. And do you, th just so, let me just butt in with one of my own. Do you think, like, so Amy Adams is playing Anna. Yes. So just coming back to what you were saying about, um, you know, how it's a passive experience and stuff. Is she going to be the face of Anna for you now as well? I mean, as the creator? When I was writing the book, I did not have anyone in particular in mind. And actually, readers might notice that the character of Anna is not described in significant physical detail. It's because I don't like to be too prescriptive when I'm describing a character's physical appearance. I don't like it when authors are too prescriptive. I feel like they're steering me towards a certain vision that might not be compatible with my own. Um, that said, when Fox asked me whom I wanted to see cast in the role, I said Amy Adams. Not that they cared, but it happened to work out. I said Amy Adams because, to me, she has a lot of warmth and relatability. She's also the right age. Amy just turned 43. And my one rule with Fox was that they could not cast anyone under the age of 35. There are very few leading roles in mainstream Hollywood films for women over the age of 35, and much less so over the age of 40. And it was important to me that this character not be demoted, or really promoted, to a younger age. She is a woman who is 39 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. Women age just as men do. That's awesome. So, I like nice. Yeah. Sorry, back to you. <laughs> Hi, Hello. very engaging session, thanks so much. Um, just wanted to ask you, uh, what was the most difficult part of the process? The research, writing, or getting it published? I'm not talking about editing since that's not difficult for you. Sure. The or, most or, sorry, promoting it by flying down to incredible India. <laughs> so, the most difficult part of the writing process is the actual writing for me. I try to write, and I don't say I succeed, but I try to write fairly interesting sentences. Most thrillers, to me, are written in a very flat style, which on the one hand means the prose does not interfere with the story, but on the other, I don't remember any of those sentences. There's an Irish-American author named Tana French who writes beautiful sentences, and I can get lost in her prose. I really like that as a reader. I respond to that sort of structure. And it takes time to sculpt and craft that kind of language. So that, for me, is very difficult, or at least challenging. I find promoting really tough. I'm very happy to be here, A, because I've never been, B, because the food is amazing, and C, because I have not been on tour for a few months. So I had a break. I had an opportunity to recharge. Last year, I visited, I think, 16 countries, and I spent all of 80-something days or something like that in my bedroom in New York, and that was exhausting. I rewarded myself when I came home in October with a French bulldog. I love French bulldogs, and I call her Ike. I thought I was getting a boy, but surprise, surprise. And when I'm struggling with some writing, I just look at her and she delights me. I love her face, I love her baby fat, I love her snoring. I do not love her flatulence, but 
Like, I've dated worse, so. Um, okay, uh, maybe one or two more questions. Maybe bring Ike next time, too. I would love to. <laughs> that would be cool. Thank you. Um, uh, I basically had a question. You talked about Gone Girl and uh, like the thriller that it is. And I was just wondering, uh, for your next novel, you kept mentioning that uh, the character in this book is very giving and very generous. Yes. And I think one thing about Gone Girl that really freaked me out personally was that she experiences something that many women experience. Yes. And it's a, like a constant theme for many women. But her response, her reaction is like... It's insane. atypical. Yeah, yes. it's very, very different. So I was wondering, would you write a character that maybe doesn't have the regular qualities of a woman? Not generous, not... Um, maybe not nice, maybe not very caring about her neighbors. You know, something like that. A woman who is not necessarily has all the qualities that women usually do? That's a really good question. Gillian Flynn, the author of Gone Girl, has spoken very articulately and very openly about how she wants to see different representations of women in fiction. Women are obviously not only caregivers and mothers and sex pots. They can be awful, awful people. I'm not thinking of my mother or sisters. I do want to make that clear. That's one of the most refreshing aspects of her novel. And because I'm interested in awful, awful people, I'm interested in people in general, I would like to write a character like that. That said, it is a tough moment, I think, for a male writer to try to portray a woman in an energetically negative light. I could be wrong about that, and... And that might be quite a sexist assumption, but I would worry that I would put a foot wrong or that I would appear to condescend to this particular character. So it's not something I would try until I became more skilled. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know, nice soundtrack to our, like as we wind down the session, any? Okay, sorry, there's one in the back. Arpita's like, no. <laughs> I think this is like a musical cue for us I to wind this, down. This right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, so uh, I read this. Hello. You might have to yell because we can. Be, yeah. Hi. Hi. Okay. So I read this book, The Grown Up, by Gillian Flynn. And uh, sorry, what's the book? The Grown Up. The Grown Up. So uh, the way she starts the book is very interesting and enticing, and uh, she said uh, she says that I don't know if I should quote that or not. Um, uh, the reason I stopped giving hand jobs was not because I was bad at it, but uh, it was because I was extremely good at it. Oh, so, I'm so sorry. I'm just having a bit of trouble hearing. Something about hand jobs and being good at them. Or am I yes, making this up? Yes. No, no, no. This. Oh, the Gillian. <laughs> the, yes, yeah, the I remember up, that yeah. the Gillian Flynn, where she talks yes. about manually stimulating men yes. for like a long time. So that's the book. That's how it starts. I mean, uh, and then I read Sense of an Ending, where the start is very random, when the author writes about five or six memories that she had, and that's how she starts. So I mean. What do you think is the best start to a book? I'll also uh, uh, talk about one more author, Indian author, G. Thail, and the way he starts his book. His preface is seven pages, uh, one sentence going on for seven pages. It's uh, written from the perspective of an opium addict. Yes. So, I mean, what is the one thing that drives, that can drive or should drive a writer, a person who wants to write a book, uh, and uh, how to start the book and how yeah. to end the book? How to start the book. The very first line of my book is, uh, her husband's almost home, he'll catch her this time. And I like to think that's an effective way of grabbing the reader, because it's, it's not a long chapter, it's actually in its way sort of suspenseful, but there's some information to absorb. It doesn't begin with someone getting shot in the head or with a hand job, as you suggest. Next time, though. <laughs> so I would, I would recommend a nice short sentence, not a paragraph, a short sentence at the very beginning to hook the reader's attention. And just to give you a sneak preview, the first line of my next book is, in a moment they'll find her. Oh, nice. That, I like to think, makes you want to read more. 
That does. And I think, um, nice. I yeah. like it. <laughs> we like it. I think that's a good moment for us to um, thank AJ Finn for being here and sharing so generously. Ah, thank thank you. you so much. Um, and thank you. You've been an amazing audience. Great questions. Um, we probably have to take you dancing at this point because of the music going on. But thank you so much. <laughs>